O God of glory and grace, we know that your Holy Spirit is continually among us, and for that we give you thanks. We ask that you abide in us and let us fill your spirit this day, this hour, this minute, to embolden us into our own future. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every heart be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So this week, we continue our series on the power of women. Now, we've had a chance the last couple of weeks to hear some, some very strong female voices. In our Bible studies, we've gotten to hear from one of our own, uh, Margaret Varelli, who is now the Minister of Christian Education at uh, Redeemer uh, UCC. She taught us about the, the ideal woman, perhaps with a question mark, in Proverbs 31. We got to hear from the Reverend Kelly Bird, the senior minister at Pilgrim United Church of Christ. And what Paul, and how we interpret Paul, and what Paul had to say on this subject. And of course last week we had Edie Russell, not one of the, uh, Dr. Edie Russell, the former economic justice minister for our denomination, talking to us about the same proverb, kind of laying all of our groundwork as we get started into this series of lifting up the empowerment of our women, not just the women in this church, but the women in our world. You know, our season of Easter is 50 days long. We sometimes think of Easter as a day, but it is in fact a season on our church calendar. And there's a reason that we're doing this in, our, in this season of Easter. We uplift our, our women's voices and their strength and their power, their equality. Because in Easter we are promised resurrection. In Easter we are promised new life. And seeing the world around us in this last year, that is a promise that we need to remind ourselves that God has gifted our women and our men, but particularly our women. It's also important, though, in these conversations that we hear from men. Not because our voices are more important, but because everyone, all voices matter in this conversation. And far too long, men have just been in roles where we have told women what to think or what to believe or what to do. And we know that lifting up and empowering our women and our girls is something that God calls all of us to do. Our Bible repeatedly teaches us that the ministry of Jesus Christ was a ministry to the disenfranchised, a ministry to those without a voice. The gospel message is, in fact, that we are all one, that we are all equal in the eyes of God. And hey, that is indeed good news. Very good news, I think. Now, we've heard a lot about sexual misconduct and the exploitation of women over this last year. From Washington to Hollywood to Alabama, all across this country, we have seen and heard women coming out of the closet with their stories of harassment. Coming out in a unified and a loud voice and saying no more. Now our goal here this morning is not to address each, each individual allegation, but to acknowledge the systemic and systematic treatment of women as little more than play, sexual playthings of the men in their lives. Now, a new study released in February of 2018, so just a couple months ago, found that 80%, more actually, more than 80% of women in the United States have faced sexual harassment. 80%. Now that ranges from hearing a lewd or a dirty joke at work all the way to the other end of the scale of being asked to trade sex for a position or for favors. And none of this, my friends, is okay. None of this. So we know that even as we work together to right things, to make things better in our society, we have to also acknowledge that this is not a new problem. For thousands of years, women and girls have been exploited for sex. 
Now, of course, we know that some men have too. But what pervades our society today is the consistent and rampant abuse of the female gender. Now, prostitution has been called the oldest profession in the world. For millennia, people from all over the world have looked down on women who trade sex for money. What we have failed to do across societies, but especially in the church, is to place the men who seek these illicit services in the same category of disdain. Now, it's still a rite of passage in some parts of this country for fathers to take their sons who are coming of age to take them to a brothel. But just like the war on drugs, we seek to punish those who are victimized rather than to punish the abusers. And we have biblical, exam biblical examples of sexual misconduct. We know that King David, there was sexual misconduct between he and Bathsheba, to put it mildly. He even had her husband killed that he might in fact hide that he had had sexual relations with her. But what about David's family? What about the rest of God's family? If we look at David specifically, his great-great-grandmother was the prostitute we heard about in this morning's reading. Her name was Rahab. Now Rahab was a Canaanite. Now among other things, this meant she was from Canaan. <laughs> Pretty simple there in the name, I think. Now I hope that we should all remember Canaan with the story of the Exodus. God freed God's people from slavery in Egypt. And after wandering the desert for 40 years... God sent them into the promised land. Now the land that God promised them was Canaan. Now this was all well and good if you were Hebrew. But not so good if you were one of the thousands of people who were living in Canaan. God promised God's people a land that was literally filled with thousands of people. And Rahab was among those people. Her house was built into the city walls of Jericho, which is in Canaan. By this time, Moses had died, and Joshua was now leading the people. He was preparing for his armies to enter the city of Jericho, to take the city of Jericho. And in his preparations, he sent two spies into the city, just to, as the text tells us, to get a lay of the land, to see what was going on. Reconnaissance. You know, we still do that kind of thing in military operations today. Now these two spies meet Rahab when they check into her house, when they check into her brothel. Now the NRSV that we heard read this morning says they spent the night there. Now that leaves a lot open to our imaginations. What does spending the night there mean? I think it leaves too much to our imagination. Because the original language tells us that they laid down there which was an ancient euphemism for sex. Now, the Bible does not give us any indication of who they laid down with, but the assumption is that it would have been Rahab. So why is she alone thought immoral when the soldiers are just seen as doing what soldiers do? And we're forced to wonder, did she choose this life? We don't know for sure. But if we look at the history of prostitution in ancient times, there's so much in common with prostitution today. Most women found their way into this line of work when there was no other option. So was there a choice? Yes, but the choice was between becoming a sex worker or the slow, painful death of starvation. Now we learn that Rahab's circumstances, they do not define who she is as a person. She is more than what she does for money. She has heard about the God of Israel. She believes the things that she has heard. She defies her own king. 
and helps the spies with their mission. And she gains her strength from God. Now if we look back to Deuteronomy 20, God had commanded the Israelites to kill all the Canaanites when they took the land. So Rahab, though, she's determined on her own. And in her determination, she helps the spies. And in helping the spies and trusting God, she secures life for herself and her family. She escapes this sentence of death. And more than that, she will become the great-great-grandmother to a nation of people. She is even listed as part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Now I can imagine that if Rahab were here with us today, that she would stand up with the countless women across our country and say, Me too. Now, Rahab was victimized, but she was not a victim. She was victimized in her role as a prostitute. She was victimized by the spies of the children of Israel, but she did not keep silent. She knew that God had promised this land to Israel, but she refused to be defeated. The book of Hebrews even lifts up Rahab as a model of faithfulness. And the book, of, the book of James, pardon me, holds her up as an example of doing good work in the name of God. Does that mean she was faultless? Of course not. The exploitation of women is a 2,500-year-old problem. Probably even longer. Rahab overcame her circumstances to not only survive, but to thrive Joshua 6 goes on to tell us that her family lived in Israel for generations. And I like what William Williman of Duke Divinity School has to say. He says, although Rahab lacked a bit in the area of conventional morals, she was a survivor. She wasn't born yesterday. Rahab had been in business long enough to know how to take care of herself. And therefore proved quite helpful in looking after some of God's own people. And she too was part of God's own people. And so were all of our women in this sanctuary, in this world, and our men and our boys and our girls. We are all God's people, my friends. Now when we think of Moses, the first thought to come to mind for many of us is we don't remember that he was a murderer. But he was. We don't always immediately recall the Apostle Paul's intolerance. But it was there. Or the cowardice of our disciple Peter. But it too was there. These men moved beyond these acts to become powerful and faithful actors for our God. And Rahab did too. She survived. She lived to tell her story and to pass along her heritage all the way to God's Son Himself. And we know that all of these people, Moses and Paul and Peter and Rahab, were chosen by God to fulfill God's plan. What we learn from Rahab is that victims of sexual harassment and sexual violence are not defined by what has happened. Rahab was loved by God in a very special way. And it is not up to us to decide who gets to be lifted up by God to do God's work. Because where we might see ugliness and brokenness and awful sin, our God sees the possibility for redemption, the possibility for a bigger life. And most of the women in this room could stand up and say, me too. And we know that just statistically, knowing that more than 80% of these women in our country have been sexually harassed. And because we know that, it is our job. In fact, I would say that it's our Christian duty to help bring an end to this environment of exploitation 
that our women must endure each day. So that one day the young girls in this congregation and in this community, in this city and in this world, one day they will never have to know what it feels like to stand up and say, me too. May it be so. My friends, I invite you into singing our next hymn. It's in your black hymnal, number 309, We Are Your People. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as you are